my role is to kind of give you the introduction or really the basics about uh, machine learning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how machine learning is very, very different from a traditional way that you program a computer. And traditionally, when you program a computer, you have to be very explicit in all of the steps that you teach it to do. So just a show of hands, how many of you have ever written a piece of computer software? OK, so you're all, many of you are intimately familiar with how explicit you must be. And even if you have a period or a comma or a semicolon or one letter wrong, that, that can totally wreak havoc in, in what you're trying to do. And so what we're really talking about is a set of uh, tools that allow us to be less explicit about the way that we're teaching the computer to perform a certain task and really do things much the way like a child might learn from experience rather than having to set, create a set of explicit rules. And so in order to understand this, we're going to uh, go through a, an example here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how a child might think or learn about discriminating between a hot dog and a hamburger. And then we're going to talk about how this works for machine learning. So uh, a child, you know, has probably, if they've never seen a hot dog before, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to identify that and say, this is a hot dog. But if you show a child two or three different hot dogs, it's very likely that they're going to be able to identify that that's a piece of food, that I'm going to eat it. It may or may not taste good. Maybe you're a vegetarian and want veggie dogs. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, the same thing goes then for a, uh, a burger. So if you haven't seen a burger as a child, you don't necessarily know what it is. You might, from context, infer that it's a piece of food when you see other people eating it, lots of those types of things. But no one had to explicitly sit down and tell you, you know, this is a hamburger. You can eat it. It's made of beef and a bun and lettuce and ketchup. And that is a burger based on all of its constituent parts. Uh, it's one of these things that seems more intuitive. So uh, when we try to do the same thing with a machine learning algorithm, we have this black box. And inside this black box, we have a bunch of different parameters. Now, this is oversimplified. There are only three parameters in this model. Some of the things that you'll hear Dr. Taylor talk about later have uh, hundreds of thousands of parameters or maybe the millions of parameters. And so when we have this black box and it's as of yet untrained, this is the child before it's seen a hot dog or seen a hamburger, each one of these you could, little parameters you could think of as a dial. So I have all these little dials and little orange thing kind of indicates where the dials are set. And when the network is untrained, all of those dials are set randomly to different places. And so in the training process, I can take an image uh, of a hot dog and I can run that image through the network, and the network will give me a probability that it thinks that this thing that I fed it is a hot dog. So uh, in that very first untrained state, uh, getting in, uh, a number of 45% is just as likely as getting any other number. And so what happens is we say, OK, we know this is a hot dog. And so we tell the, the algorithm, hey, tweak these parameters just a little bit and see what happens. And so we tweak the parameters a little bit, and we run the hot dog through again. And uh, it actually got worse. So what happens is that there's a set of mathematical feedback loops that will say, OK, that wasn't a very good optimization. Go back to the previous one and try again. And so when it goes back to that previous one, uh, we spin the dials a different direction and run it through, and now you get a higher confidence. So after you've done this millions of times, it gets to the point where you've set all of the dials to a place where uh, they can more reliably identify a hot dog. And one of the things that we do in order to increase the ability of the network to discriminate that is that we feed it not just one picture of a hot dog, but lots and lots and lots of different pictures of hot dogs. And after you feed it lots and lots and lots of different pictures of hot dogs, then what happens is you can start to show it hot dogs that it's never seen before. Uh, of course, if we show it one that it has seen before, now it's very confident that this is a hot dog. If you show it uh, something new that it hasn't seen before, then it may be less confident. Now, 
The other thing is that all we've done right now if we, is that we've trained a hot dog detector. Okay, we haven't trained something that can really identify different types of food because all we've ever done is shown it lots of different hot dogs. So if we run some new thing through it that it hasn't seen before, the only thing that it's going to be to able to identify in this is that it's not a hot dog. So uh, this has a very low percentage uh, uh, possibility of becoming a hot dog. So what all of this boils down to is the fact that there's really no free lunch when it comes to machine learning. And uh, what we really need to have is a huge amount of labeled data that comes from uh, a variety of sources with lots of different types of pathology on it uh, in order to train something very robust. And so some of the latest research papers that are coming out in radiology are really kind of tempering some of the early excitement about this uh, set of techniques because that labeled data and that process is actually very expensive and very tedious and time consuming to execute on. So uh, many of you, how many of you have heard of computer assisted detection or CAD? All right, cool. So uh, CAD was another way to take uh, an image and say, is there a feature in it? And probably in clinical radiology, the most common example that we have of this is using CAD for mammography. So uh, in order to screen women for breast cancer, we take uh, a radiograph or an x-ray of the breast tissue. That special x-ray is called a mammogram. And uh, we run those through a computer algorithm. And the computer-aided uh, detection says, well, I think that there's a problem right here. And so uh, what happens in a typical computer-aided detection uh, model is that explicit programming that I was talking about earlier, where someone actually creates a program that says, OK, this is a hot dog. What are the types of steps that I would need to do from an image processing perspective to look and determine whether or not this is a hot dog. So I might write a piece of software that would identify a stripe of mustard on the image. I might write another piece of software that looks for a tubular meat-like product. Uh, I might look for another, write another piece of software that says, OK, if there's brown on either side of the tubular meat-like product, it's likely to be enclosed in a bun. And I might have uh, scores associated with each of those. And those are based on features that I know and understand about my <coughs> definition of a hot dog. So if you take this into the radiology space or in the medical space, you can do the same thing and write a detector for breast cancer. So on the right-hand side of the screen here, you have a mammogram. There are a set of uh, fairly uh, ugly-looking calcifications in the middle. Those calcifications show up as bright white dots. So what I might do is I would write a set of computer algorithms to process the pixels and say, if the pixel values are very high and they're arranged in these very uh, kind of bizarre patterns, that I might give that a higher weight or a higher score, saying that this is going to be uh, some sort of breast cancer. And then I would do things based on the other types of imaging features that we think about, like whether or not there's a mass or architectural distortion. And so. Um, what happens is we're really identifying and taking all of the medical knowledge that we know about how uh, disease looks in a particular image and trying to teach a computer explicitly how to do that. So if we go back to our food example, uh, in order to teach our uh, CAD algorithm a way to distinguish between food types, I have to create all of those little pieces of code to identify lots and lots and lots of different types of food. So if I wanted to find pizza, I would have to write you know, some other set of algorithms that would be able to identify uh, the unique features of pizza in an image. And I hope that you can understand that this, our ability to write this very descriptive code really doesn't scale very well. So the, the take home message here is that uh, computer-assisted detection, or traditional CAD, has really been based on human understanding of images and really human-defined features. But when we go through machine learning algorithms and things that uh, my colleagues will talk about a little bit later, these are really machine-detected features. 
And that gives us a much larger opportunity to plow through a ton of data very quickly rather than uh, a, a small amount of handcrafted features that are written by a, a, a programmer or a group of programmers. Again, what this means is that we can scale this very quickly, much like uh, early server arrays where people had things, computers shoved underneath desktops. That's not really our model anymore. Scalability with things like Amazon, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure have really replaced uh, a lot of on-prem compute. So that scalability is also important to us from a machine learning perspective. So, one other question here is why did this imaging machine learning get so hot right now? And really what we have, we have two things to thank for that. One is that it turns out that all of the uh, computer technology that's been created for the video game industry in creating really, really fast graphical processing units, uh, turns out that those processors are particularly well suited to this process of machine learning that we're talking about. And so all of the money and innovation that got poured into NVIDIA and companies uh, like Intel and ATI really now is being uh, transitioned and leveraged for this machine learning revolution. The other really important thing is that uh, there's this thing called the ImageNet competition. And so what ImageNet did um, was essentially create this large repository of labeled data that was required to, uh, to do these challenges. So I'm just gonna introduce this, this concept briefly, but the ImageNet challenge actually isn't anything new. It's been going on for a very long time. Uh, back in 2010, you can see these traditional computer vision things as the blue dots here. Uh, and the blue dots have kind of steadily been marching towards an improvement, but this orange dot here I think you'll appreciate was a real outlier in 2012. Uh, and this was a, uh, a network, a convolutional neural network, which is something that Andrew is gonna dive into, uh, that really blew this world apart because everybody had been focused on writing each one of those little feature detectors in the past, and now they're moving on to these, these neural networks. And then you can see in 2013 and 2014, everybody has pretty much abandoned the, the traditional feature pieces of this and they're all focusing on neural networks. And if I had the later data, you'd see that the error rate's just continuing to plummet. Again, uh, what ImageNet is, is really a set of those labels, a set of information that says this is a hot dog or this is a burger or this is a mountain or this is a bicycle and coupled with these public images that allowed people to get the millions of images required to train a network to have uh, discrimination between lots and lots of different types of things. And so uh, what we really need in order to try to uh, move the field here is we need to take all of those images of random you know, photographs and really replace those with radiology images that are high, high quality and labeled. And this is something that's very expensive and it's gonna take quite a long time. All right, so just a couple of uh, challenges, a couple of things to think about, not really something that we're gonna dive into today, but uh, a couple of hot topics. Uh, this is a very big one. You know, If you put a machine learning algorithm in place as a diagnostic uh, tool, uh, who's gonna be to blame if they make a mistake? What are the medical, legal, uh, and malpractice risks that are going to be involved there. And we're asking ourselves much of the same question when it comes to autonomous vehicles and lots of other things. So we're gonna wait, I think, for, our, um, for the industry to catch up with us there. There's also a lot, of in, a lot of ambiguity amongst the United States about who actually owns the medical record. Uh, and in California, the hospital or the physician actually owns the, the data in the medical record. So uh, that's not the case in all the states. So there are a lot of privacy issues and a lot of legal compliance issues that are going on around creating these big data sets. Uh, and then, of course, this is uh, somewhat famous now. The, uh, apparently, the National Health Service got in trouble back in May for uh, giving one of the Google startups access to uh, a bunch of the, their patient data. And I, I think that I highlight this not to paint Google in a disparaging light at all, but just to uh, highlight how tricky these issues are. And I'll just read this little bit to you. It says, uh, 
This response by Google shows that DeepMind has learned nothing. There may, be, there may well be lawful reasons for third-party IT providers to process data for direct care of 1.6 million patients. Unfortunately for Google's AI division, developing an app is not one of them. Remember that I told you earlier that having this large volume of labeled data is really the only way to develop these algorithms. And so uh, this to me is, a, this is published in Engadget. I mean, this is not a you know, random uh, conspiracy theory type of blog. So uh, I, I just think that this kind of underscores that the legal issues and the privacy issues haven't really caught up with where we, where we need to be. So uh, in summary here, we talked about machine learning. We talked about human identified or uh, human defined features that have to be explicitly coded for. We talked about how machine learning relies on machine detected features. And we talked about some scalability, uh, why ImageNet was really important uh, in Landmark here. And we talked a bit about some of the legal issues. And with that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew Taylor to take us a little bit deeper into this uh, black box. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Taylor. I'm an interventional radiologist here at UCSF. And uh, one of the main areas of my research, along with Dr. Mongan, uh, is focused on utilizing machine learning to identify critical features on imaging studies. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 15 or 20 minutes taking you through some of the concepts behind deep learning uh, and computer vision as it's applied to pictures in general, um, as well as an example from our current research uh, working with x-rays. Uh, it's going to be a conceptual talk. Uh, there's very little math or computer science, but hopefully you'll uh, come away with an understanding of how these things work in a general way, um, which will stand you in good stead at your next cocktail party. Uh, well, your next Marin County cocktail party. I'm not sure it'll hold in, down on the peninsula, but you know. OK, so I'm going to start by describing a clinical problem that we are trying to tackle. Pneumothorax is a condition where air gets into the chest, but it's outside the lung. Uh, so this can cause collapse of the lung, and that can be a life-threatening emergency. Um, on the left here, we have a normal chest x-ray, and uh, I really want you to just focus on two things. First, notice that the lungs are dark, because they're mostly air, uh, and they have a fine, wispy branching pattern uh, throughout them, which is the normal appearance of blood vessels and airways. Second, notice that this wispy pattern goes all the way to the edge of the chest, where it meets the ribs. Uh, contrast this with this picture here on the right. Uh, this is an example of a very large pneumothorax. Uh, the, the right lung looks pretty normal, but, but the left chest just looks too empty. Uh, it turns out that that's because the reason you're not seeing this fine branching pattern is that the left lung is completely uh, deflated and collapsed, and uh, that little lump there uh, outlined by the arrows is the left lung. Now, pneumothorax isn't always as obvious as this particular example, um, but here's another one. This is an example uh, where you can see that the, uh, the lung markings don't make it all the way up into the upper right chest, and they end at this curved line here, which turns out to be the edge of the lung. And in fact, if you look even more, there's another one on the other side that looks pretty similar, but it's a little harder to see. Uh, so here's the problem. Pneumothorax can be a big emergency. Uh, and it's usually seen on chest x-ray, sometimes very easily, sometimes not so easily. Uh, but a typical hospital may generate hundreds of chest x-rays in a day, and unless a study is flagged for immediate review because somebody's freaking out about it, uh, they tend to get read in the order that they're obtained. Uh, so it may be a little bit of time before that study gets reviewed. Uh, in the case of a freestanding clinic, there may be no radiologist on site. And so then the burden is on the primary doctor uh, to review the images and make sure that there isn't some sort of big problem going on. And in some countries, there are very few radiologists, period. Uh, and so there can be a long delay before a film gets officially looked at. So our goal here is to develop an algorithm that can screen these images and alert the radiologists to turn their attention to the, you know, the potentially more uh, serious findings first, um, or can contact that point of care doctor, the ER, the urgent care doc, and say, you know, the algorithm's worried about a significant pneumothorax here, so please look at this image and contact the radiologist right away. Um, an algorithm class that's well suited to doing this kind of work is a convolutional neural network, uh, which you may have heard of, uh, because it's the type of network that companies like Facebook and Google use uh, to organize your photos based on who or what is in them. Um, and it does play some role in the development of things like self-driving cars. 
If you Google convolutional neural network, you're going to find lots of pictures that look like this, which seem pretty opaque and confusing at first. The top picture is actually the grandparent of the algorithm that the US Postal Service uses to decipher writing on handwritten mail. Um, and the lower picture is an example of a, it's a more generic example of a network that's being asked to identify pictures of vehicles, so cars, trucks, bicycles, et cetera. They share a lot of common features, uh, and as I'm going to show you, they kind of break down into two parts. Uh, on the left is the part that's trained to answer the question of what are the key features in this image, and on the right, the part that says, okay, given, given these features and how they're arranged in this picture, what do I think this picture is? So these diagrams kind of typically flow from left to right when a, a, a network is analyzing an image. But to dig into this deeper, I'm actually going to talk about the right-hand side first, and then we're going to look at the left. So looking at the right side first, this is the what do I think this picture is side. And to understand a little bit better how this works, I think it's helpful to know why these networks are named as they are. Uh, you know, why are they neural networks? So these are not trying to replicate a brain in silica. Uh, and in fact, if you carry the parallels too far, they start to break down, and it makes hardcore computer scientists and neuroscientists alike both very irritated. Um, but there are two basic ideas that I think are helpful here. The first involves how neurons are connected and how they communicate. So in the center here, we have a, a neuron, and it's receiving input from three other neurons. Uh, the input may be excitatory, it may be inhibitory, uh, but the input is being collected and kind of summed up by this green neuron in the middle, and based on that input, it either fires its messages to downstream neurons or muscle cells, or it doesn't. Um, you know, the, the threshold for this action can vary from neuron to neuron and even from moment to moment. Now this is a schematic of a mathematical model that is a correlate of the picture that I just showed you. It's called a perceptron, and it was developed in the late 1950s. Uh, it shows a, a neuron, or a node, uh, here, which is really just a place where some computation happens. Uh, and it's receiving input from uh, some, uh, basically four other neurons off to the, to the left, and it's sending its output off to the right. So think of it kind of like the three-way switches in your house where you have more than one switch controlling one light bulb. Um, <clears throat> in this example, I've set it up so that two inputs are on and two of the switches are off, and that that's serving as the input. But this perception isn't very impressed by that, so it stays in the off position. But if you add one more on signal, then it reaches its threshold, and it sends out a signal that, that serves as input to similar units further downstream. So this is a little more complicated than that because there are additional numbers involved here, which are called the weights. Um, and that has something to do, basically makes, makes it such that the numbers don't have to be only zero or one, and not all inputs have to be viewed as equal. Um, so a slightly more accurate metaphor might be to use a dimmer switch here, but in general, this is how you get the idea. Now, if we take a lot of these little discrete computational units and we arrange them in multiple layers, where each node receives a lot of input from its upstream neighbors, uh, then we may be able to do some much more complex things uh, than just the on-off that I showed you. So this is really the basis for that output, uh, similar to what Dr. Coley was talking about with the whole hot dog, not hot dog. Uh, it's that, the, that's the basis for that kind of output. So this is how you answer the what do I think this is part. In that network that I showed you that looks at cars and trucks and so forth, these outputs are generating a number that reflects how likely the picture is that it's been shown a car or a bicycle, et cetera. And so part of the learning that this network is doing when it's presented with lots and lots of pictures of cars and bicycles is it's making very small adjustments to all those weights that go with the inputs, which hopefully improves its likelihood of making the right call. So this is part of why these networks are called neural networks. And at a conceptual level, this is how the network is going to classify or make decisions. Now, the second parallel between these networks and the brain starts to show how the left side of these networks function, the side that deals with what are the key features in this picture. It comes from some seminal work in neurobiology and physiology uh, done by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel starting in the 1950s and for which they received the Nobel Prize in 1981. They were looking at how the visual system uh, worked in the cat, and they were making recordings from individual neurons in the cat's visual cortex. So, for this example, they're presenting a stimulus in the form of a bar of light, which is here, uh, and they're projecting it onto the screen in front of the cat, and they're recording from a particular neuron. 
Uh, and when they first present a horizontal bar of light, they don't really get any firing of the neuron. As they rotate that bar towards the vertical, they start to get more uh, and more stimulus. And you get maximum stimulation when it's vertical. Uh, and then it starts to roll off again as the bar heads back down to horizontal. So they had discovered that some of the lowest level parts of the visual system were basically feature detectors, where they might respond to an edge or a bar of light at a certain angle. Um, and other detectors might respond to certain things like color or motion. And this has extensions into the human visual system, um, which I've shown with this diagram, uh, where a person's looking at a head or a face. Um, <clears throat> they have these sort of lower level uh, parts of the visual cortex that are responding to these basic edge shapes. Uh, and then they have connections that go higher up in the chain that start to assemble some of these basic shapes into compound or more complex shapes. And then you go higher still, and you start to see these higher level representations of, of objects like eyes or ears or, or, or face or head shape. Uh, and then obviously you can lay a lot more information on top of that, but this is sort of a, the, the basic idea. So how do we do this with a computer algorithm? So here's a picture of someone you know. Your visual system possesses the features, excuse me, processes the features, and you very quickly say, this is a picture of Abraham Lincoln. But if you'll pardon the anachronism, say you pull out your iPhone to get a selfie of you and Abe, uh, and that image is recorded by the phone as a grid of pixels, uh, blocks where each block is a single color uh, or a single level of gray. But this isn't really what the computer sees either. Uh, each of these pixels has a number associated with it that describes how light or dark it is, except the computer doesn't really know what light or dark means kind of either. What it sees is this, a grid of numbers. So how does an algorithm start to pull out features that might be important in identifying what's in a photograph? And this is where the convolutional filter comes in. A convolutional filter is just a small grid of numbers, something like 5 by 5 or 7 by 7. And the numbers in that grid are used to process the pixel values at many positions throughout the image, really just using multiplication and addition. So the filter is kind of about a postage stamp size relative to the size of most images. And so it is convolved over the image. It is moved or slid like a window across all the positions that it fits in an image. And the computer does its multiplication and addition. And it generates uh, a single number based on the, that grid at that position you know, at that time, uh, because it's only looking at a very small set of the pixels. So this is an example of that multiplication and addition that I was talking about. The, uh, the orange is a little filter being slid across the green image with its pixel values, and it's doing multiplication and addition. And for each position, it's generating a single number, which is in the, the pink uh, there. Now, that gets assembled into its own little grid, and that's called a feature map or an activation map. And a convolutional neural network, network will use hundreds or thousands of these little filters, each with its own unique set of numbers, and each one generates its own feature map, and then they all get passed on to the next level, which often is another set of filters that works kind of just like this. And so when you start to stack these things together, you start to generate some higher level feature detection, like we saw in the slide where the, where the human was looking at the face. So here are two filters, two example filters, being passed over an image. And these filters both happen to be kind of edge detection style filters. Um, and they generate similar but slightly different feature maps. Um, areas that are bright on these feature maps are places where the math has produced big numbers or big activations. And dark areas uh, are where the activation is low. And so the learning here involves tuning the values inside these filters to produce feature maps and activations that are going to go on to provide helpful input to the second half of the network, that classification part uh, that helps it make correct decisions about what's in the image. Uh, so now it's important to note that I'm showing you things like edge detection, which is something that we humans can understand in terms of like, oh, I get, it. I get what the algorithm's doing there. But m in many cases, perhaps in most cases, the filters and the feature maps may not produce something that humans can really understand, which kind of alludes to why Dr. Coley started off by saying it was a black box. But in some cases it can, and this happens to be one of those cases, and it's a nice example. So this comes from a paper that trained networks uh, using images of human faces. And the low-level activations look just you know, similar to what I've shown you before. They look like they're excited by curves and edges, et cetera. These low-level features start to pass their activations on to higher levels, and they're starting to be assembled into things we can recognize, like 
eyes or noses or seems to really like eyebrows too. Um, and as we go even higher, we see very complex activations like complete faces. Um, so in this kind of a network, in this example, at least some of the ideas of build, starting simple and kind of building hierarchically, um, you can see some parallels between this and some of the neuroscience slides that I was showing you earlier. So let's go back and look at our, our diagram of, the, of this convolutional neural network again. And as we train, we're typically processing images from starting off going from left to right. And the first part, which contains these convolutional filters, which are the little boxes, um, is, the, is the sort of can I highlight important features part. And after a number of these layers, it, it generates output that's passed to the multi-node neural network that, that I showed you first, the what do I think this is, this picture is part. Um, so the big difference between these algorithms and some other image processing algorithms, as Dr. Coley mentioned, is that we are not telling the algorithm look for edges or look for colors, et cetera. The computer is figuring out what it should look for on its own. And how is it doing this? So in most cases, the, the picture has been labeled with what it is. Um, so the algorithm has shown many, many pictures, and it goes through its computation, and it produces an output, uh, which is a series of numbers that mathematically expresses its best guesses as to what each of these images are, what class it falls into. Um, and that mathematical expression gets compared against another mathematical expression that represents the truth, i.e., what the label that was applied by a human says the picture is. Uh, and so then you can basically calculate just how far off the mark the computer is, at least after a given round. Uh, and then through the magic of calculus, the computer derives what direction it needs to go to try to make that distance a little bit smaller, basically to make it less wrong. Uh, and once it has that information, it actually then propagates back through the network uh, right to left here. And it basically makes very small changes to all of those weights the numbers in the filters that I showed you, and the numbers in between the nodes in that neural network that was part of that first example. And once it's done that, it then goes back through the algorithm from left to right and sees if it's decreased how wrong it is. So if you do this many, many times back and forth, forward and back propagation as it's called, you're trying to get the predictions to be closer to the truth um, through repetition. So you'll hear it said that these algorithms are data hungry, which is true. Um, this is a big difference between humans and computers, as Mark alluded to first. Humans are very, very good at generalizing their knowledge based on limited experience, at least when it comes to vision. So I can show a child this picture, and I can add a couple of labels, and pretty quickly that child gets pretty good at separating cats from dogs, even cats and dogs that don't look like this, and cats and dogs that's never seen before. So maybe we have to show it a few more versions than just one, including the cat with the tutu, but it doesn't take very many examples before you start to generalize your experience. Computers are not good at this. So for them to do reasonably well on this same task, they need to see a lot of images, like a whole lot of images, potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of images. But if you have the data and you have the labeled truth, then these classifiers start to get very, very good at doing this kind of thing. So let's return to the clinical problem for a couple minutes. Uh, we've labeled images as part of our research as having a pneumothorax or not but we haven't provided any information to the computer as to where that is or even really what it is. Uh, so the computer needs to learn and to develop a set of features that will help it to separate these pictures into the correct categories based on the labels that have been given by the human, by the radiologist. So what might these filters look like? Now, as I mentioned before, many of them are not particularly human interpretable. And so there, these are some, I've done some hypothetical examples that are. Um, but they're valid um, in that there are many filters, and this is potentially one of them. So if we looked at the left upper chest in these two images, we could imagine that a filter um, might have one level of, of activation due to that fine branching pattern of the lung parenchyma, the lung tissue that I showed you before. Um, and it may have a very different level of activation when it's presented with this very monotonous, dark uh, space that lacks those markings. So this might be one feature that helps to distinguish between the presence or absence of lung in an area that's supposed to have it. Um, similarly, another filter uh, might pick up on the presence of this extra line here uh, that in the upper chest, it doesn't seem to be part of the ribs, it doesn't seem to be part of the normal configuration of the lung, um, and it's seen a lot of normals. So it, this may too also 
provide some contribution of there's something about this that's different, and that may tip the algorithm in favor of abnormal or pneumothorax. Now, needless to say, many pictures of pneumothoraces look different, and many normal chest x-rays look very different from one another, uh, even when they don't have a pneumothorax. So really, the only way to give a computer a lot of experience so that it can make predictions about images it's never seen before uh, is to have lots and lots of pictures. So for this project, uh, we've assigned labels to thousands of chest x-rays. Um, human radiologists have assigned these labels. And uh, we've tried to include as much sort of normal variability as we can offer it. Uh, and then we've done some things to expand that data set even more so that by the time that we're training, the algorithm is potentially exposed to 100,000 or more images. And this seems to be a, a reasonable sort of minimum requirement um, to produce an algorithm that yields decent results for this kind of a clinical problem. So how are we actually doing? Um, pretty well, if I say so myself. Uh, you know, our work continues, but we've been able to build models um, using a lot of the techniques that I've talked about tonight um, that can catch the majority of these uh, pneumothoraces that might go on to become a serious problem for the patient. And we're still working on the problem. There's still a lot more to be done. But we do seem to be pretty well on our way to having a useful uh, tool that can assist uh, the radiologist or the primary doctor in these situations. Um, and the tool, to, in order for it to be created, it, it kind of has to leverage the wealth of data that we have at a center like UCSF and be guided by the clinical knowledge and experience um, along with lots of hard work and, and experimentation. But um, this is a very exciting time in medical imaging, I think. There's a lot happening and a lot more being promised. Um, and as with all exciting times, it'll be interesting to see how much gets delivered and how much turns out to be hype. Um, but with that, I'm going to stop and let my colleague, Dr. John Mongan, tell you a little bit more about that um, based on his experience. So thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying tonight's session. Good evening. I'm John Mongan. I'm the Vice Chair for Informatics for the Radiology Department. Um, and I have the pleasure of talking to you tonight about what I think all this means, where this is going. Um, in terms of the future of radiology for radiologists and for patients. So the future of radiology, based on what we've seen tonight, you know that radiologists look at images. You've heard from Dr. Coley and Dr. Taylor that AI, these deep learning convolutional neural network algorithms, in a sense, also look at images. And these AI algorithms are pretty good at looking at these images, and they're rapidly getting much better. And there are certain advantages to an AI algorithm over a human radiologist. They don't get tired. They don't take vacations. They don't complain about their office space. So a natural question is, what does this mean for radiologists? And a lot of people have thought about this and have spoken about this. And somewhat famously, or perhaps infamously, um, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who's an emeritus professor of the University of Toronto and now works for Google. Um, and this, uh, this is a, a guy who is widely regarded as one of the founders of this sort of recent explosion in neural networks and artificial intelligence, and one of the world's leading experts on this. Gave a speech last year, a talk, a seminar kind of like this one, um, in which he said, it's just completely obvious that in five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. And just in case the implication of that, because it takes five years to train a radiologist, was lost on anyone, he followed that up by saying, they should stop training radiologists right now. Uh, and there are a lot of people in engineering and computer science who have expressed similar, um, sometimes even more extreme, thoughts and positions on this. And this is something that's been picked up by the popular press and has led to a series of articles of which this uh, that you may have seen in NPR from a couple of months ago is uh, one of, just one of the more recent examples uh, that have made the, the usual analogies between radiologists and buggy whip manufacturers and have created kind of a popular impression that radiology uh, is really, at least for radiologists, a field in its waning days. So why am I standing here talking to you instead of feverishly preparing my resume for a career change? Well, I would represent to you that uh, while Dr. Hinton knows an awful lot about artificial intelligence and neural networks, and probably more than I will ever know, he doesn't actually know that much about radiology. And in general, I think these people predicting the end of radiology don't 
fully understand what radiology is and more specifically what a radiologist does. And the key is that radiology is not just a perceptual task. Uh, to use Dr. Coley's uh, analogy, it's not just the medical equivalent of distinguishing medical hot dogs from medical hamburgers. What a radiologist does is a radiologist is a physician who specializes in using technology to make diagnoses. And AI is a new technology. And it's a new technology that is getting very good at some perceptual tasks. But those perceptual tasks are not all of radiology. They're a small part of it. And AI is a long way from being able to perform the full range of cognitive tasks of diagnosis of the full range of human disease on all the different kinds of imaging studies that we can do. So really what we have with artificial intelligence is a new technology that's capable of doing some of the important things that radiologists do, perhaps doing those things better than radiologists do, but not all of the things that radiologists do. So in thinking about where the field of radiology is going, we need to try to understand how that, something that can do some of what radiologists can do, maybe faster, maybe more efficient, maybe better, but not all, will affect radiology. And it's difficult to predict the future. So one thing that we can do is we can look to historical analogy. So I'm going to take a step back from talking about the future of radiology for a minute and talk about the history of radiology. And radiology is a field that was founded on scientific discovery and technological innovation. And the key initial discovery and technological innovation was the discovery of the x-ray. Um, and the, the x-ray was, was radiology for most of the, the first half of the, la, uh, the last century. To the extent that in hospitals like this one that have a long history, you can still find signs that point towards the radiology department that just say x-ray on them. And in that, in that world, that x-ray world, you have to have radiographs like this one here of the pelvis. And one of the, you know, one of the key skills that a radiologist had was to be able to look at this image, which is a flat 2D image, and makes this pelvis look like it's something flat and recognize that this is actually an image of a complex three-dimensional structure. And to be able to sort of understand and synthesize in their head what that three-dimensional structure looks like. So for example, I know from my training in anatomic knowledge, and many of you may know as well, that the pubic symphysis right here projects forward in this pelvis. And the ischial tuberosities here and here project backward. But that's not immediately apparent just by looking at this flat image. And that ability to perceive the three-dimensional shape based on anatomic knowledge and training was, was one of the things that was sort of a key differentiator, a key skill that radiologists had that many of the other people in the hospital didn't. And in the late 1970s, there was a technological advance. And CT scanners started to become available. And CT scanners are essentially three-dimensional x-ray machines. And rather than creating a single image where all that three-dimensional complexity is collapsed down into a single image, they create a series of cross-sectional images going across the patient. So if we look at a CT of this patient, we can see that going from forward to back, we see that the first thing that comes up, I'll let it play through here again, the first thing that we see is this pubic symphysis here in the middle. So we know that that's towards the forward. Towards the, the forward. As we go further back, we see these ischial tuberosities. And so that complexity of trying to understand what the 3D relationship was that was once entirely the domain of people who had been trained to recognize it, mostly radiologists, then became something that a machine did far more accurately and far more quantitatively. And so one could imagine that we could be sitting here 40 years ago in a similar seminar talking about the advent of CT scanners. And someone might have advanced the idea that a CT scanner does better than radiologists at evaluating 3D structures. 
and could have proposed that that meant that the future of radiology was that really radiologists were going to go away because now this skill that radiologists had had to train for years to acquire and was a unique talent of radiologists was now accessible to everyone. And anyone looking at the CT scan could obviously see what the 3D relationships of things were. And so you know, any doctor could then just start looking at these images, and you really wouldn't need radiologists anymore. If we look at what actually happened with the advent of CT scanners, CT dramatically increased the diagnostic power of radiology. And along with that increase in diagnostic power came a whole range of new complexities in how the machines were used, all the new things that you could see and what those meant, how you interpreted those, how you understood artifacts. And so rather than leading to you know, the end of radiologists or to a decrease in the number of radiologists, it actually led to an explosion in the demand for radiologists as radiologists did what radiologists do, which is use technologies to make diagnoses. And now they had a new, more powerful tool that allowed them to make all different kinds of diagnoses that they had never been able to make before. And so I think our friend Dr. Hinton has spent some of the last year talking to some radiologists, because this year he gave another talk in which he said, the role of radiologists will evolve from doing perceptual things to doing far more cognitive things. Now, this is a very, very different statement from the one that he made last year. Because last year, he was telling us, radiologists, pack your bags. You are done. And, and this is very different. This is saying, well, there's going to be a role, a cognitive role, for radiologists to continue doing diagnosis, which is what radiologists do. And they won't maybe be doing quite as much of the perceptual task, because that's something that artificial intelligence is really good at. So what this means is that if we look at AI in medicine, these convolutional neural networks, deep learning in medicine and in radiology, really my experience is, and, and what we're now told by one of the leading lights of the field, is that this is not ready to replace physicians. It's not that it's not ready to do anything. You know, I'm working on this project with Dr. Taylor, and I wouldn't be spending a lot of time on that if I didn't think it had any value. It does have a lot of value. It will, I think, soon assist with many tasks that radiologists do, particularly these perceptual tasks. And so what I think that this points to is a future of radiology where we have improved diagnosis that's delivered by human radiologists doing what they do best, working in conjunction with AI, doing what it does best. And I think that there are, if this is the model that we're going to, which I firmly believe that this is, this is the potential, this is where we can actually realize benefit for patients um, from AI in medicine, that has some very important implications for how we get there, for how we develop these algorithms. If you're starting from a premise that you're working on creating these algorithms to look at medical images, if you're starting from a premise that you're replacing radiologists, then how radiologists work, how they think, what they need help with, really isn't all that relevant because you're replacing them. They're going away anyway. And so if that's the model that you're working from, and this has been a common model of many of the tech startups in the Bay Area and around the world, then your development, in your development model, AI specialists, computer scientists, really have the central role because they're creating these algorithms. And radiologists have, at most, a minor temporary role in labeling and creating these data sets. But once you have sort of extracted their knowledge in terms of labeling and creating the data sets, you can kind of crumple them up and throw them away because you don't need them anymore. But we've just discussed that replacing radiologists is really not on the table anytime in the near future because these algorithms can't do the whole range of cognitive tasks of diagnosis that you need to replicate what a radiologist does. So that model really isn't what we need to be doing, because that takes us in a direction that's not going to be effective in producing something that's clinically useful or that benefits patients. What we need to be doing, what Dr. Hinton has suggested, is that really the role for artificial intelligence in the foreseeable future in radiology is assisting radiologists. And so if you're assisting radiologists, you really need to take a different approach. In that case, what you're doing is you're not replacing the radiologist, but you're developing tools 
that are going to help the radiologist. And those tools need to be tailored to effectively and efficiently work with the radiologist. So you absolutely need to understand the way radiologists work, the way radiologists think, what they perceive as the things that they know how to do, what they struggle with, what they think the problems are, because you're creating a tool for someone. You can't create a tool for someone to help them do their job if you don't understand them and you don't understand their job. In, under this model, AI specialists are still extremely important because you need to be able to create algorithms that are going to be accurate, that are going to be powerful, that are going to be useful. But radiologists are now equally important because you need them to identify what the problems are, to direct the work so that the tools that are created are things that are actually useful to radiologists and fit effectively into their workflow. And so another implication that I would suggest is that uh, this suggests that the environment for where we can optimally realize the potential for developing this, this, uh, these algorithms, much of the early work on this has happened in tech firms, in computer science uh, groups. But I think that academia, and in particular academic med centers, are actually ideally suited to pushing forward this work that needs to be a collaboration between computer scientists and radiologists and physicians. And some of the reasons for that are we in academia are very experienced with cross-discipline collaboration. I think in many ways much more so than uh, a lot of startups and a lot of people who are in the pure tech fields. Um, many of these tech firms, even the ones that are explicitly working on developing algorithms for radiology, have no radiologists in their company. They might have you know, a couple who they have as consultants who come in a couple hours a week. Maybe they only label images. Some of the really larger firms are now starting to hire a couple of physicians. We've got hundreds of radiologists here and thousands of other medical specialists. So we have very easy access to the medical knowledge that you need to do this. Uh, my colleagues talked about these algorithms and these approaches being extremely data hungry and needing lots of data. This is a major problem for most people in industry trying to work on these problems. They don't have access to data. We have access to decades of radiological images here. Once you create one of these things, you need to test it. You need to see if it actually works well, if it actually does help radiologists, if it actually leads to better diagnoses and better patient outcomes. Um, Getting access to a clinical environment where you can do that testing is very difficult for most companies. That's something that we're embedded in here, and not just any medical environment, but a medical environment that is used to and tuned to innovation and trying new things and research and testing things. The one thing that by design as a public university we don't do directly is turning these things into product and commercializing them. Um, but we have a lot of experience of collaborating with corporate partners who do that in tech transfer and IP licensing. So we're really very good at you know, that translational aspect of partnering with other organizations and companies to move these into the commercial realm where they can actually be distributed outside of our university and impact patients. There are resource requirements for doing this, for realizing uh, this goal. Uh, you need to support research time for physicians to do this. Um, this, is, this is difficult work. It's not something you can do on the, on the nights and weekends. You need to have dedicated time to doing this. Um, you need data engineers and data management infrastructure. One of the first things that you discover when you start to do this work um, is that you need to have a way, you, you know, it's very data hungry, you have these mountains of data, you need to have a way to organize and to collate and to manage all this data you have in an efficient fashion. Once you've created these data sets and you can manage them, you need data scientists who know how to create these networks, how to train these, uh, train these networks, manipulate the learning parameters so that they train optimally. And then additionally, you need these GPU graphical processor unit based computers that can execute these algorithms and do this training efficiently. And we've laid the foundation for uh, doing work in all of these areas, all of these different requirements, and are, we have work underway to expand the capacity in all of these areas so that we can realize the potential of really pushing this forward into something that's going to be a tool that helps radiologists and patients. So 
to, to summarize, I think the key points that I'd like you to remember from what I had to say here today is despite what you may see in the popular press, and I think that the future of radiology looks very bright, both for patients because of improved accuracy and ability to diagnose disease, and radiologists because there's going to be new tools that radiologists can employ to be able to make diagnoses that they've never been able to make before and make them more accurately and efficiently. I expect that uh, cutting edge radiologists will be routinely using AI based tools within the next few years. And I think that academic medical centers are the ideal environment for bringing together all the elements that are needed to really realize the potential of AI in this you know, sev next several decades where AI is something that is assisting physicians to provide better medicine to patients. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'll invite my co-panelists to come back up here, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Sure. So, so the question was, uh, we have a lot, if I understand correctly, we have a lot of diagnostic technology currently in use. Um, we like to think that we're pretty good at using it here, and we have a pretty high standard of diagnosis. So, you know, we're, how, how will AI improve upon where we already are? Um, so, you know, I'll give my thoughts on this, and my, my colleagues may have, have something to add as well. Um, I, I think that predicting the future is difficult. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the one thing that I can say with certainty is that there will be changes and improvements, and that many of them will be things that are unexpected. But some of the things that I would expect, um, the work that Dr. Taylor and I are working on are, is working towards uh, making these diagnoses more quickly. So, you know, if you can prioritize, if you can recognize which studies are more likely to have disease and read those first, then you can get the diagnosis more quickly. And sometimes, you know, for acute diseases, acute problems, more quickly is, you know, is earlier treatment and better outcomes for patients. Um, I think that, you know, part of this may be, we've talked about computers, AI is doing perceptual tasks. And there are some perceptual tasks related to screening uh, that it's possible that in the near future, uh, AI may do better at, you know, not missing things. It's difficult to go through thousands and thousands and thousands of images and with 100% fidelity identify every single circle that, that you should be seeing on there. Um, and so, you know, I think that computer-aided detection, computer-aided, uh, the traditional computer-aided detection in many ways never quite got to where we hoped that it would, but I think that this may help to reduce the, what is already a very small fraction, but we would like to get down to as close to zero as possible, um, things that are imaged but maybe get, get missed. Um, do you have other things that you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, just one other thing to add. I think that uh, machine learning today, remember how I talked about human-derived features and machine-derived features. So. Uh, I have friends that are working on uh, training machine learning networks to detect things that humans may not even be able to see. So for example, uh, if you're looking at the genetic pattern of a brain tumor, uh, we're, they're finding that they can train a network to identify the genetic pattern in ways that the humans don't even really understand how the computer is doing that. And that's very exciting and very scary all at the same time. So uh, having the, the, the capability for the machine to be able to define and detect features that we don't understand, I think is another place where that diagnosis can go even farther than where we are today. But again, we'll use that as a feedback mechanism on our own to improve our own understanding of disease. Dr. Dillon. Um, John, we're very fortunate to have a fantastic radiologist here in uh, UCSF and in the United States. There's some variation. Um, and then in the world, there's even greater variation in the uh, number of radiologists and uh, the quality of radiologists. I wonder if you could comment on the potential of this to, for sort of global health. Yeah. I, um I think that there's a, an important application for that in areas that are really underserved uh, by, by radiologists. Uh, you know, as, as we discussed, I don't think that in the near future, 
uh, these algorithms are going to be able, to, that you're going to be able to create a digital radiologist, that you're going to be able to replicate the full range of cognitive tasks of, of diagnoses. Um, so, you know, even for these underrepresented areas, for these, you know, developing areas, um, I, I don't see this as replacing a radiologist, but I think that it may have great application in terms of prioritizing and screening. So, you know, there may be a situation where you have, you know, a country where, you know, in the United States, every, every radiograph that's taken is red. Uh, there are many areas in the world where that's not the case. And I think that there may be a lot of utility in this in focusing and prioritizing the time of the radiologists that you do have available towards uh, the images that are more, most likely to uh, demonstrate disease uh, and have impact on patients. So I think the question is, uh, can you give a time frame for when some of these things might clear some regulatory hurdles and um, become more mainstream, at least in, in say, U.S. Uh, medical centers? And then also, when do we reach this point of the data is there and, and it is, it's analyzed in ways that may not be human interpretable, but essentially pulls out, you know, features that we, do, we don't see well? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, I don't think I have a great number or numbers to give you. Um, this is something that, that people are still talking about and debating uh, in terms of how is the FDA going to even deal with this. Their, their um, experience is much more in devices to some degree, but, but drug discovery and so forth. And the development of that and, and even the processes by which you need to show steps in development are very, very different than these kinds of models. Um, and I think there's an, a second question there, which is people are developing the tools right now. But as John alluded to in his talk, there is the validation side of all of this. Is it, is it going to generalize well in a number of settings? And also, is it effective? Um, if, if we develop some great detector that does something really, really well, but it's doing it as well as a radiologist, and it takes five times as long, then we haven't helped anybody. Um, so I think it's going to be, I think it, there, will, there will be some things that, that get announced as, look what we can do. I think the process of approval is probably still years of sort of sorting that out, a few years. Uh, and then there's the whole validation piece. So maybe, I don't know, would you pick a number? So, so Several years, yeah, five years? I, I, I think. <laughs> I, I would agree with, with everything that, that Dr. Taylor said. And, you know, I think, um, I don't think that this is going to be a, a big bang. I don't think that this is going to be something where, you know, it goes along for several years and then you show up for work one day and all of a sudden, like, you're in a fully AI-enabled yeah. reading room. Um, this is going to be something that phases in gradually. And I think the initial applications of these are going to be things where it, you know, it, it are going to be the, the lower bars, things where if the AI messes up, it's not that big of an issue. Um, so things like prioritizing studies. You know, if currently you're not prioritizing your studies at all, if you have an AI algorithm that prioritizes them, even if it doesn't prioritize them quite correctly, you haven't really lost anything. And if it does prioritize them correctly, you've gained something. Uh, if you have an AI algorithm that automates some task, like determining a a volume, a 3D volume of something, and you visually inspect what it's done, then if it messes up, you see it right away. And so there's, there's no problem. And I think that those are the kind of applications that we'll see first. And I think we'll probably be seeing those kinds of applications where really the, you know, the physician, the radiologist is immediately checking every step right away. Probably, you know, timelines are tough, but I'd guess three to five years. Um, and then as time goes on, we'll start to see some of the, you know, the higher bars, the more difficult things, you know, things where it's, you know, as, as Dr. Coley talked about, things that involve a diagnosis that, uh, that a human can't really directly see, like what subtype of cancer, you know, what subtype is this tumor, um, where there's not really any way for a human radiologist to directly verify that. That's going to require a lot more regulatory 
a higher regulatory bar, a lot more validation. I think those kinds of things are further down the road, 10 years maybe, and a complete digital radiologist where the CT scan or the MR goes in one end and a complete report comes out the other end, um, I don't expect to see in my career. I, I think it's possible that we will get there someday. Um, by the time we get there, we will have AI that's sufficiently advanced that it won't just be replacing radiologists. It'll be replacing attorneys. It'll be replacing reporters. Um, and so it will be a big change, but it will be a big change for on a much larger scale than just radiology. So you're not worried about job security? I, I am not worried about job security. I, I would just add one tiny little brief thing, and then we'll get to the other questions, that the FDA is really drawing lines and saying that diagnosis is really something different mm -hmm. and will have to have more layers of approval and a more stringent process. So they're, they're trying to figure out where to draw those lines between the different types of tasks that John outlined. But I think some of those things where you're uh, the prioritizing work are going to get, they're going to get approved fairly quickly because there's really not much risk to the patient, not much change to the process today. Thank, thanks for your question. So the, the question uh, was if, if does the image quality, is it, does it have a big bearing on how the algorithm performs? And I think that a big part of that is uh, what it was trained on. So if the algorithm was always trained on a perfectly executed frontal chest radiograph and never had any variability in that radiograph exposure or otherwise, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, for the algorithm to understand a radiograph that's maybe not on axis or maybe not obtained with a good exposure. So I've been involved in some other research that uh, I've actually worked in Kenya and collect digital chest x-rays, and we were trying to have a computer vision process where we were describing features and cutting out the lungs and all the stuff like I talked about in my talk. Uh, and that is really quite sensitive to uh, the variability between good quality imaging and poor quality imaging. But some of these newer convolution neural networks like uh, Dr. Taylor talked about are much less sensitive to that image variation if they've seen it during training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I, I would just add to that briefly the, the project that, that we're working on. Um, we see and hope for uh, actually quite a bit of variation. I, I realize that you're asking about overall level of quality of the imaging and so forth. Um, but the technology that's available in many places is, is, is very good. I mean, even worldwide in terms of the kinds of images that they're producing. Um, and so one of the things that we're striving for is when you get a very large data set is you want the data to be clean in the sense of you don't want it to be, you, we're not trying to make a classifier for chest x-rays, but we're accidentally feeding it skull films or something like that. But at the same time, we actually really do want as many different ages of patients, what they're getting the chest x-ray for. I mean, I can tell you a chest x-ray that's taken at your local screening clinic where you walk in under your own two, you know, on your own two feet under your own steam and get that chest x-ray looks very different than you if you are unfortunately in an ICU really sick with something. So we actually look for a lot of that variability in the hopes that things will be more robust. Uh, but you do raise an excellent point. That there's going to be sort of a, a, a minimum level of quality or, or even just speaking the language of making sure that the, the image that you're presenting is what the algorithm was trained to look at. And then the variability we see as a strength in that, provided that you're kind of playing within the, the rules. Uh, so what is the financial reality of these technologies actually being accessible to a wide array of hospitals and communities with lower resources? I know it's depending on uh, the partnership with uh, mm -hmm. industry, but mm -hmm. is there any kind of anticipated reality? So, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's still a bit of an open question. I think that there are a lot of very encouraging aspects um, to that. Uh, the, the software tools that people are using for this are largely open source software that's available to anyone. So really, you know, the, the major barrier is having the knowledge to use them. And that knowledge is available on the internet to anyone who wants to sit down and work through the math and work through the, the computer programming. Um, the, 
the compute resources that are needed are not insignificant, but as an example, the you know NVIDIA is one of the you know a, a, a top of the line GPU compute sort of supercomputer, if you will, goes for about hundred thousand dollars or one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Now that's a lot of money, but when you consider that a top of the line MR scanner goes for three or four million dollars. Uh, on the scale of radiology and, and imaging, it's actually not that much money. And that's for the top of the line. And you can do useful work with a lot less than the top of the line. Um, so you know, in terms of accessibility of these resources to, you know, in places where there are limited resources, I think it, it actually looks pretty promising. And additionally, the, the resources that you need for creating these algorithms, for training them, are much higher than the resources you need for executing them. So you, you need a lot more compute power to create the algorithm. Once the algorithm has been created, to just run images through it and get them, you know, get them classified, get them detected, you don't need nearly as much compute power. So please add. Yeah, just, yeah, just one great concrete example of that. So anybody that has an iPhone, if you go into your photos, you can actually go into the search function and you can do something like type mountain. And it will look through all of the photos in your photo stream and it'll pull up the ones that have pictures of mountains. It's a fantastic exercise to try. I did this. It actually found not only the pictures of actual mountains, but also paintings of mountains that I had. So uh, it, the, 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 the ability to deploy these algorithms, once they're trained, takes much less computer hard, uh, much less computer uh, horsepower than in order to create these algorithms. Uh, so, two questions, kind of a uh, one step, two step. Uh, for auto segmentation, which you mentioned earlier about taking a 3D volume and delineating the specific volume, uh, does UCSF already have active research in auto segmentation and? or any sort of open source software that you would point to for uh, best in, in current class? So uh, yes, there, there are some research groups in, in our department that are, are working on that, um, particularly in, in uh, musculoskeletal imaging. Um, I'm not personally directly involved with those efforts. Um, I, I, wouldn't be able to uh, to point you to a best in class for you know what what software you should use uh, for that. Um, but yes, there are, there are people here working on on auto segmentation and. And then I guess the second question is, uh, at UC, do you guys use transfer learning uh, for any of your networks currently? Okay, so the the question was, um, are people using transfer learning and? So transfer learning is the idea that you have these networks and uh, you can start, as, as Dr. Coley uh, mentioned, with random, with all the parameters randomized. And if you start with them randomized, um, then you need to have an enormous amount of input data to get those parameters into a reasonable state. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can say, uh, as Dr. Taylor was showing, the, the first layers of these networks um, really just look at features, things like bright spots and dark spots and lines. And really, that's kind of like the basic wiring of a vision system. And those features probably don't vary that much, whether you're looking at hot dogs or hamburgers, or cats or dogs, or pneumothorax or no pneumothorax. And so the idea of transfer learning is rather than starting with random weights start with a network that was already trained to do something pretty well, like the ImageNet network, for instance, which recognizes pictures of dogs and cats and boats and trees and all kinds of things. And use that as your starting point instead of random weights and just replace the top few layers of that. Um, and so with, with that very long <laughs> Uh, introduction to, to your question. Um, the answer is yes, most people uh, who are looking at medical imaging, most of the research that's uh, presented uses transfer learning um, because it's very difficult to generate a data set that is large enough uh, to where, where you can outperform transfer learning by starting from, from random weights. 
Just as a, a quick aside on that, actually, on a different project, but looking at x-rays um, that we had done uh, last year, or was it two years ago now? Uh, last year, I think. Um, we sort of, we were looking at ImageNet images because the, 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 the images are available as this gigantic data set. And uh, so x-rays are generally black and white. And so we looked at this and said, well, we should try to do our own sort of, we do take advantage of transfer learning, but we were also curious as to whether or not we could transfer learn by training on a subset of those images. And so we looked at the classes and thought, well, what's kind of like an x-ray, mostly sort of monochromatic? And we picked architectural features, fungi, and something else. Was it trees or plants yeah, trees, or something? I something I just, just things that had a lot of these kind of angles and were not wildly colorful, et cetera. And it, it, it worked very well. Um, so yes is the answer, and, uh, and we've had some experience doing that specifically for x-ray projects. A very long yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, when you train a neural network, you train it towards some particular output. In, in the AI field, we call that ground truth, that this image does have this disease on it, this image doesn't have this disease on it. And uh, the question is, that, that, ha that ground truth has to be somehow established, and there's going to be some imperfection and some bias in how you establish that ground truth. And so how do you, how do you deal with that? And so uh, that, that is a key issue in, in these AI, these machine learning approaches, is you're only as good as your ground truth. The best you can, the best you can asymptotically approach getting to 100% agreement with the ground truth that you've established in your training set, but you will never get better than that. And so if there are biases, if there are uh, inaccuracies in that, then that's going to be reflected in the performance of, of your network. So you know, some of the approaches that you take to that, some of them are familiar from other research. You do you know, multiple different radiologists reading and you can look at consensus. Um, and that can try and get you towards, you know, performance that's maybe better than any individual radiologist, but a performance that is sort of the, uh, a composite of multiple expert radiologists. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the potential for this technique is, you know, looking at things other than radiologist interpretation of images as ground truth. We don't have to be limited to that. You can look at, you know, pathology data. You can look at patient outcomes. You know, what, you know, rather than looking at whether a radiologist thinks that there is disease on this image, you can look at, well, was this patient still alive or was this patient still able to walk a year later from this? And I think that that's really the avenue by which we're going to try best address these bias issues is by looking at more objective, patient-relevant outcome measures as our ground truth. Um, now, that becomes more difficult because there's a lot of noise in those signals and you need even more data than you otherwise would. But I think that's really where some of the true potential of these techniques lies. So just to add to this question of ground truth, if we go back to the FDA question previously, uh, as John's indicated, you can have a training set of data and you can make that algorithm run really well on that training set of data. But what are you going to do when you go to try to commercialize that and you want to sell it? And now you're going to show it other data that it's never seen before. How is the FDA going to validate the claims that are going to be made uh, based on that algorithm for that set of training data, and where is the ground truth for the FDA's validation data going to come from? So there is a whole myriad of questions that really need to be answered. That's a fantastic one, and again, one that we don't have all the answers for yet. Um, okay, so there were a lot of aspects to that question that I'll try to unpack. Um, so I think that the central question was uh, personalized medicine in many ways involves analysis of very large amounts of data uh, that really require computational techniques. And you know, certainly no person would be able to, for instance, sit and analyze a genome uh, by, by hand. And so given that, uh, does that suggest that really computers will take over all of this, this work? Um, so, you know, I, I would agree that, uh, that, that computational, you know, that personalized medicine does generally involve 
a lot of sort of large data kind of techniques, um, and that computers are essential in analysis of, uh, of those data, um, both with traditional analytics and, and calculations and machine learning um, techniques. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we see is, you know, as you know, in informatics, in in biology, in medical informatics, in personalized medicine, is that the there is oftentimes a thought that with automation and with the increase of computers, that there will be less need for people working in these areas. And I think that what we're seeing, what we've seen historically, and what we will continue to see in at least the next several decades is actually the opposite of that, that you need more and more people to understand how to apply these techniques, when they work, when they don't work, and how to interpret the answers that come out of them and put them in an appropriate context. Um, and I think that that's likely to be the trajectory and likely to be what is happening in terms of humans and computers working on analyzing these large uh, collections of data for imaging, for personalized medicine, um, for the foreseeable future of the next several decades um, of my career. Uh, you know, at some level, I am a neural network, a very complicated neural network, as, as you are, and it's possible that at some point, we get to the point where we can create a neural network that has similar complexity to you or me and similar cognitive ability. And when we reach that point, it will be a major, major change for humanity. Um, but what my feeling is that that is at least many decades off, if not a century. And so I think that's something that is interesting to think about, but is not a present situation for us to deal with. I think we have time for one more. I think we have time for one more question. The gentleman in the back. I want to take the opposite of that. Uh, uh, who evaluates radiologists? You know, you, know, you know, maybe in the third world there's radiologists, but maybe they're no good. So uh, uh, how do you know they're good? I think that that's something that we we kind of struggle with from time to time, whether it's in the third world or whether it's here. You know, uh, the one of the examples that I was given uh, in the past is, you know, an airplane pilot is graded on whether or not they made the landing, and at the end of the flight, you know, whether or not they made the landing. <laughs> uh, I think one of our challenges is that I might read a CT scan today, and we may not know for five. 10 years whether I actually did that correctly or not because it may take time for that patient's disease to manifest itself. And so that question is one that we are constantly struggling with and, and is, is part of the basic biology and the set of problems that we deal with in medicine. So on that note, I think we've come to the end of our presentation. I want to thank you all very much for coming out this evening and for your interesting questions.